welcome to Horizon. It is great to have you here, whether you're a regular tender or you're here for the first time. Maybe you're here because you heard about our series. Maybe you're here because you want to see me get beat up, up doing some jujitsu. Maybe you lost a bet with a buddy. Whatever it is, we're just delighted to have you here as we look in more lessons we can learn about our, our, our everyday life, decision-making life, our parenting life, our how do you process things in our life as we begin the last session of Jesus Jiu-Jitsu. We are back in the jiu-jitsu gym, and Marty is letting me try it out on the big stage. I feel like I've graduated in some way. And today we're talking about a technique Jesus talked about called thinking with two hands. And I'm amazed in jiu-jitsu how often I'm having to think about multiple things. What am I doing with my hands? What do I do with my feet? And then also, what am I doing with my eyes? Absolutely. Um, you know, I call it seeing the big picture. In any combat sport, there's so much going on that, you know, the term I use is seeing without looking. Uh, you want to see your opponent without really looking at them. And with the drills I'm going to have William and Thorson do with you, uh, you're going to need to see them but not necessarily look at them because one drill is going to be evading mm. and another the next drill will be engaging them. Okay. So uh, let's see how this goes. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like confidence, does it? Right, let's see how this goes. All right, both of you coming at me. Here we go. All right, so that's why I in, in, invade by pushing them out. Invaded, yes, all right, sir. So now I'm coming into their space, all right? Now Go you're going to invade. Thanks, Ian. All right. Man, there's just so much to think about there. Man, thanks for letting me know kind of how wow. it works. Yeah. The thing about what Jesus talked about is, again, in almost every situation or challenge we have, business, life, family, there's multiple things to prioritize at once. We have to think with both hands. And in that, most of us want to do more than just survive life. We actually want to thrive. So today we're going to see how this technique of thinking with two hands helps us rise above our circumstances.
So how do we rise in life? How do we thrive in life? And how can thinking with two hands allow us to do that? Have you ever noticed that often in our life, issues, decisions we make are complicated? And yet often people only see a particular issue through their their main objective, or through their main criteria. And, and, and rather than balancing this issue with that issue, with this issue, the, with this issue, to see what the best decision is, we have a tendency to lean one way or the other. Some people are risk takers. Man, they got the risk down. Like, if you think about this bar and two sides, they take risks all the time. And they face consequences of the time because they can risk well, but they don't know anything about assessing risk and caution. Other people are really good at caution, but they never do anything because they think that you're supposed to be safe in life, but life isn't safe. Others of us, we're really good listeners. Man, we can listen well. We can have compassion and empathy. But sometimes when the person we're listening to might need you to say, I don't think that's a good idea. Are you sure you want to do that? We're not really good at speaking truth because of our need to be needed. Others of us, we don't struggle with speaking truth. But we've heard our spouse say and our kids say, could you listen first before you make a decision, before you decide what I should do? Could you actually understand? See, we're so good at leaning to one side or the other, but usually in every issue there's multiple values that need to be leaned into. Some of us are really good at productivity. Go, go, go. Do, do, do. I'm one of those. We're not so good at presence. Just being with an employee. Being with a spouse. Being with our family. Others people are really good at being. They're so laid back. It's like, do you ever get anything done ever? Right? It's both are important here. Some people are really good at consistency. They know the policies, they know the rules, how things are supposed to happen, but there's no flexibility at all. Other people are so flexible, eh, just see how it goes, that it's chaos because there's no general guidelines of how anything works. Some people know how to enter into grief, the sadness of things not going the way they hoped and wanted, but they spiral into depression because they don't know how to incorporate hope into that. Others can do hope well, but it's almost like this syrupy hope This seems disconnected from reality. Like, you know, life is hard. It's not all rainbows and lollipops. How do we bring hope and grief together? As parents, often we're really good at obedience. My kids got to obey me. But is there a place for mercy and grace? And second chances as well. Today I want to talk about how can we think with two hands. And in doing so, you can be successful and lean into just one side, without a doubt. I mean, even in MMA, there's an MMA fighter by the name of Nick Knoll. And uh, Nick has one hand. He was born with a particular uh, disease that allowed him to, you know, lose one of his hands. And he's, he's winning 16 and 3. He's been very, very successful with one hand. You can be successful in life and relationships only thinking through one issue. But you're never going to fully thrive until you learn how to think with both hands. There's a professional trainer. He wrote a book called Do Hard Things. He trains runners and other professionals. And he likens that the Bobby Knight approach to coaching does not line up to actually what the evidence shows. Oh, you can train people to be afraid of punishment or be afraid of being embarrassed. But real coaching doesn't just instill in a, a, a person you're mentoring the fear of being punished, but a real love for the intrinsic value of, of discipline and progress. He ironically said, too, that in parenting, the most domineering parenting styles create the most rebellious kids who rebel against those rules they hate. They don't see the principle behind it. And ironically, the most permission-giving parenting styles, I love you, I care about you, emotional connection, but no discipline and no structure, create the most insecure children. You need structure and emotional connection mixed together. So whatever area of our life, we want to find out how can we mix these together by thinking with two hands to thrive, to rise above normal living and normal decision making. So to do that, we're going to look at two handy idioms, reminders of how to use our hands. The first one are the nunchucks. The nunchucks. Two hands are better than one when it comes to processing. 
Whenever something comes to your attention, I need to listen well before I speak. I also need to, when I'm listening, sometimes be willing to speak. I need to measure all these different values. And so when something comes to your table or something comes to, to in front of you as an issue, what are all the values that are at stake here? And I'm going to weigh each one. And which one's weightier than the others? How am I going to weight this value higher than this value as I make a decision? If you've ever been on Broadway, there's a uh, Broadway show called Fiddler on the Roof, a movie as well. And one of the songs in Fiddler on the Roof is a song called On the Other Hand. And if you remember it, it goes, uh, uh, this Jewish father, because it's a Jewish technique, his daughter is going to be married. She's young. The guy she's getting married to is young. And so he sings a song. I won't sing it for her, but it goes like this. He goes, on the one hand, this young man wants to marry my daughter. On the other hand, he looks like he's too young. On the other hand, they seem in love. On the other hand, you can't live on love. On the other hand, I've never seen my daughter look happier. On the other hand, how do they provide for themselves? And in this song, you see this Jewish technique as he's taking all the different issues to bear on the one hand and on the other hand. So I want to show you before I get into how Jesus used this technique, I want to show you how the nunchucks, you can do them well with one hand but actually even more powerful too. So to do that, you've been meeting Marty for the last five weeks. He's uh, agreed to join us today. Can we give a warm horizon welcome to Marty Sloan. Marty, come on down. Thanks for being here today, man. Thanks Most for everything welcome. you've done Most and welcome, shared with us. It's been a blessing. Well, I appreciate it. So I'm going to give you guys a couple sets here. So we're going to practice a few of the things to see the difference between one hand and two hands. So let's start off with why don't you go with like one set of nunchucks and one hand. What can be done with that? Okay, well, um, you know, nunchucks are used, any weapon is used for multiple opponents, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, you're right. There's different applications for one hand and one set and two hands for two sets and two hands for one set and whatnot. So, um, okay. I see one-handed. All right. Wait, wait, wait. You said <laughs> one set. You said one, one set. One, one set. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, one set. Okay, one set. One, one set. Hand. One hand. What can be done with one that set? That means one I'm hand. not going to switch hands. Okay. <laughs> I wonder if some now it might look like I'm just aimlessly flailing about, but everything I'm doing has a purpose. Like the figure eight I'm doing in front of me or behind me. That's for if someone is coming at me with a bow staff or a knife or punches or kicks. It's to keep them at a distance. Mm -hmm. And when I'm coming around my body like this, it's to generate more force. More speed, okay. Yeah. Yes. Now how about two sets with two hands? Two sets. Two sets. And it kind of limits me, mm -hmm. obviously, because sure. both hands are occupied. But <laughs> once you get proficient, woo! <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you catch them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> so uh, what... And what are the advantages that you're getting when you have, you're still one-handed, but so what, going from one to two? It's a wider spectrum. Yeah, so I mean, people come at you from any angle, you're Any angles, and, and okay. there's more risk when I have, there's more risk to the opponent coming at me if I have two. Yeah, now I also, I didn't realize that, you know, typically there's a chain in here, um, and these are padded, obviously, for all of us who do it and smack ourselves in the head. I didn't realize that the chain is actually part of it as well. So show Absolutely. me. Absolutely, uh, you know, if, uh, if they have a bow staff, Let's use your arm as a bow staff. Hmm. It comes at me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, and then I, I can control you. Oh, yeah. I remember those takedowns we did? Uh -huh. I can do the takedown with the, <laughs> yeah, with so the nunchuck. So it's not just you're hitting people or defending with it. That becomes a way to grab whether my arm, break my arm, or grab the staff. That's the weapons are extension of my body. The chain or the rope is an extension of the nunchuck. All right, so now show us two hands with one okay. nunchuck. With one set and two hands. I have more options. I can go around my. Woo! <laughs> can we give him a hand? Man, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Well, Marty, it's been so awesome hearing your story and uh, how you've helped us with this whole series. We really appreciate you. So. Well, like I told you earlier, man, um, it's kind of hard for me to put into words, but this whole experience has given me a sense of responsibility that I never had before mm. in a very positive way, and I just can't thank you enough. Well, thank you for making me look like I'm slightly competent. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. 
So you can see one-handed processing works, but two hands are better than one. You can see all the reasons why, both for offense and defense. So Jesus uses this idea all the time because it's a Jewish technique of thinking with two hands. He, he applies this in a parable he gives one time. It's a short little story. One time in a business scenario, another time in a political scenario. Here's the thing. He says, which of you, when you intend to build a tower, so you're about to do a building project, which of you does not first do something else? You first say, I want to build this. You first say, I want this. And then you next thing you do is you take the other hand and go, let's consider the cost. Do we have enough finances to finish it? Or even if you do have enough to finish it, do we have enough to afford the ongoing amortization of its costs, right? He's affirming both hand thinking. You want to build something? The first thing you do is you balance the other side. Can you afford to build it? He said, after all, after all, if he has laid the foundation and then he's not able to finish it because he doesn't have enough money or doesn't have resources, what's going to happen? All who see it are going to mock him saying, hey, that man began to build it and wasn't able to finish it. Because he had one-handed processing. He knew what he wanted. He's a good spender, but not a good saver. No elbowing each other. Other people are such good savers, they never spend on anything. How can we enjoy life by saving well, spending well, assessing the cost of things, but also the project? That's what Jesus is getting into here. Two-handed thinking. Then he goes on and gives a government example. He says, how about a king going to war? What king going to make war against another king... And Lois, again, does not first sit down. Always he talks about the first thing you do before you engage in something is you think with both hands. First, I want to go to war. First, I've got a cause. First, I've got something I'm trying to accomplish. Second, do I have enough people to accomplish this war? And if that king sits down and realizes, I have 10,000 people, but I'm coming up against somebody with 20,000 people, what do you do? <laughs> you send a delegate and say, let's make peace. Because you're your outnumbered double, right? Suddenly you're interested in peace because you realize that what you want to accomplish is going to cause more pain than good. Now, the reference Jesus uses here is not just some kind of random number. In Jesus' day, there was a guy named Herod Antipas. And his dad, Herod the Great, had divided his kingdom into four places. And Herod Antipas was a bit of a scoundrel, but he had taken over a, a quarter of Israel. And, and he had a wife... But he kind of liked his brother's wife better than his wife. Her name was Herodias. So he was up visiting Herodias, and he's like, hey, how about you leave my, my brother, stepbrother, and how about you come get married to me? She's like, I kind of like that idea. So he comes home, kicks his wife to the curb, divorces her. He then comes home, basically grabs his brother's wife, takes her away, and brings her to the southern portion that, she, that, that he's in charge of. He then decides he's going to defend it by taking 10,000... 10,000 people to kind of hold the fort. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, kind of confronts him on, on what he's done, how wrong it is. It doesn't work well for John the Baptist. He gets beheaded. Well, his brother, who just lost his wife, isn't real happy about it. So he gets the Romans kind of involved. And guess how many they come down to fight against his brother with? 20,000. So when Jesus is referencing this, many scholars believe it's not just some random number. He's actually referencing an actual idiot king living during his day. He used to call this guy a fox. He used to call him a, a reed that shakes in the wind. He, just could be, he could just be, had no stability to him. You could convince him of anything. So Jesus is referencing this idea that even in kings we know it, even in building we know that. And then he goes on in that passage and he says, just like when it comes to following me, you can't follow me if you don't consider the cost. On the other hand, Jesus says he offers you eternal life. On the other hand, maybe he's crazy. On the other hand, he gives proof for what he did of supernatural things. On the other hand, how do we know it's true? On the other hand, there's four biographies written in detail about his life. On the other hand, he might want me to make changes I don't want to make. On the other hand, if he's really God, he would know better how to live life. On the other hand, I still don't want to change. But on the other hand, whatever I'm giving up, he's got incredible rewards for me in heaven. Jesus says he wants you to consider the cost before becoming his follower. Think with both hands as you process this. It's kind of his main point. Now, in the war analogy, it's interesting because in, in Japanese history, you see almost the exact same thing happen. Because the samurais were slowly kind of going out of vogue or going out of popularity because the emperor has come in and destroyed the feudal system in Japan. In doing so, the emperor has taken over Kyoto, 
But the samurai in general, under a particular general, are still pretty much in control of Edo. The general decides, with all the feudal system being destroyed, all the samurai pretty much were hired by feudal lords. So now the feudal lords are gone, the samurai are best impoverished. All these skills, all these things, but pretty much most of them can't even afford the rent. They can't even afford to pay for anything when they used to be pretty lucrative. So this general, who's upset by the treatment of the samurais, decides to gather an army of samurai warriors and go to Kyoto to take on the emperor. He thinks he's going to take the emperor by surprise. He's wrong. The emperor not only saw them coming, but the emperor had samurai working for him. Now this was unheard of really at the time. The samurai were almost always on the same side of one another in general. This is almost like a civil war. You have samurai against samurai. Not only did the general not surprise the emperor when he came to Kyoto, the emperor is ready to go and had him far outnumbered. Destroys his initial attack and didn't just stop it. He pushed him all the way back to Edo, crushed him there, imprisoned the general, and then he said this is no longer going to be a samurai town named Edo. So he took the letters from Kyoto, look at Kyoto's letters, he changed the letters up to spell Tokyo. A way of saying the emperor now rules here in Kyoto and here in Tokyo. But to his credit, he realized that the men serving under him were certainly serving under command, and those serving under the general were doing their honorable thing by serving under them. So instead of punishing the samurai that worked for the general, he actually forgave them and allowed them to live in peace. He mixed grace and justice, mercy and insubordination. He weighed all the different things to bring peace. There's an old uh, Jewish parable from the third century. The Jewish rabbi used to say, they liken the world to a goblet made out of clay. And if you poured ice cold water into it, the goblet would shatter because it couldn't withstand the cold. And they liken that to God's mercy. If God just said, hey, whatever goes, I love you no matter what, you wouldn't have any justice. Suddenly God loves you even if you're a murderer or you're a rapist. You can't have just mercy. On the other hand, when it came to God's justice, it was like scalding hot water. If you pour scalding hot water into the goblet, goblet, it would also shatter. And if all of us were held accountable for every thought, every action, everything we've ever done with no mercy and no second chances and no compassion, the rabbi said, who could stand? So God in his wisdom poured into the goblet of our world the ice cold water and the scalding hot water at the same time, mixing perfectly grace and truth. That's actually how John the Baptist, or John, sorry, John the Disciple introduces Jesus in his biography. He says Jesus was full of grace and truth. Always the perfect blend of graciousness and kindness and second chanceness and mercy, but also truth telling and speaking what was right and speaking what was wrong. He, he got that blend right. So first, the nunchucks. Two hands are better than one processing. Are you really listening to all the issues at stake before you start making your conclusions? Two, the second handy idiom we're going to look at is that of uh, the Ezekiel choke. So this is a technique used in jiu-jitsu. So here again, we're going to bring good old Andrew back. And again, I want to thank Ryan for getting in here last week, so it's good to have uh, him back from vacation. So here's good old Andrew. So Andrew, we're going to imagine I'm wrestling against Andrew. And what we're going to find is when it comes to the Ezekiel choke, you don't want your left hand to know what your right hand is doing. Part of what makes jiu-jitsu work is you don't want to telegraph your moves or else the other person sees it coming. If I was talking to Jeff Kenny who goes here and he's talking about how some of the moves that you're doing jiu-jitsu, especially the Ezekiel choke hold, it actually can be in a place where it even feels more comfortable. You know, as we're wrestling around together, I get my arm under the neck. It's comfortable. It doesn't feel like in any way he's in danger. He doesn't see it coming. But as we're wrestling back and forth, the Ezekiel choke, I begin to move into this place. And as my hand comes down, he still doesn't feel like he's in danger. I'm then going to grab my own elbow, and then I'm going to grab my own uh, uniform. And now, in a second, without him seeing what my left hand or right hand was doing, I actually have got a choke hold over him. And as I'm pushing in, I'm going to keep moving my hand down the uniform until he finally taps out in a submission hold. But what makes the Ezekiel choke work is that the other person doesn't see it coming. If anything, it feels convenient, it feels comfortable, I'm not in danger, and then all of a sudden, I am. And in that moment, I've locked in in such a way he cannot break free. 
the Ezekiel choke. You don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, two ways to apply this. Jesus is telling a story about God. He says, God wants to do work in your life. He's got promises for you. He's got plans for you. And he likens his plans to a, a sower who drops a seed into your life. He said, and that's going to grow and bring you joy in your life, bring you wisdom in your life, help you to make better decisions, help better relationships. But as it begins to grow, you need to be careful because something's going to choke that out. What's going to choke that out? You think he's going to list like all the bad stuff, do not murder, do not commit adultery. He says, no, no. The thing that chokes out God's work in your life often are good things. What? The sower sows the word, and the cares of this world, worry, anxiety, so much going on, the deceitfulness of riches. You thought if you got a bigger house, or you got a second house, or you got a third home, or if you got that dream car, that it would make everything work. And it was awesome for about a week. For the house, it was awesome for a year. And I was like, oh, maybe we could upgrade it as well. He says the desire for other things, that insatiable appetite to upgrade everything all the time, begins to slide in and choke out what God's trying to do in your life. And you become unfruitful. So think of it this way. When we buy stuff, we buy stuff to have more joy, right? I bought this because I thought my life would be happier. I bought this because it would bring more joy into my life. But if you always have to upgrade everything all the time, you're so consumed with upgrading everything all the time, you can't enjoy the things you have at any time. When folks go to our church to, to mission trips, to Belize or Cancun, they're just struck that in other cultures people can be so happy with so little and how we can be so not happy with so much. That's what Jesus said. Be careful that your ambition becomes insatiable. You become defined by the biggest and the best. And there's nothing wrong with having big and best and good things. But when you don't realize it's become your identity, there is nothing you can ever buy, nothing you can ever get that will be big enough to fill your soul. Your soul is too big. You have an eternal soul and it cannot be filled with temporal things. And when you try and fill an eternal hole with temporal things, it's just going to choke out what you really want, which is joy and satisfaction all along. So Jesus says, here's the secret. When it comes to money, some people are really good at spending, but not good at saving. Some people are good at saving, but not really good at spending. Some people are really good at giving, but it's like, we don't have any money to give. He says, when you begin to see yourself as a manager of God's resources and you give in a certain way, it allows you to balance. You give well, you save well, you spend well, and you love upgrading things, but you're not defined by those things. You can enjoy the things without always having to upgrade them again. He's critiquing religious charitable giving here. He says, take heed that you do not do charitable deeds before men, meaning to be seen by them. So what would happen in those days is they'd walk up to the, to the offering plate and it'd be like a metal canister and they'd take their gold and silver Clank, 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 clank. Clank, 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 clank. You know, cash in a dollar for pennies. Clank, 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 clank. Look at how generous I am by making all that noise. He says, you're not really being generous to serve others, to be sacrificial. You're doing that to be seen by men. <clears throat> you can have that if you want, and you're going to get reward. People go, wow, they're so generous. But there's a better kind of giving. There's a better kind of remedy for this. See, when you do that, when you get your reward before men, you have no reward for your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet. I'm about to give. Like the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the streets. That they may have glory from men. Their whole motivation is to get credit for themselves, thanks to themselves, me, 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 me. Then he says, here's a different type of motivation. That will bring you joy and satisfaction, but also challenge you to whether you're really giving to give or just giving to get. As I say to you, they have their reward. A few people clapping for them. But when you do a charitable deed, when you're really motivated by, I want to be generous to God the way he was generous to me. I want to serve other people the way God served me. When that's your motivation, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. I mean, you're not making a big scene about it. You're saying, I'm going to give over here, but I don't need to get credit. I'm going to give over here, but it's not all about other people. 
that your charitable deed that was done in secret, your heavenly father will see what's done in secret and then he will reward you openly. And Jesus says, this is just smart. You can have a little reward now, that's fine. Or you can have a lot of reward later. You can have a little applause from the people in your culture now or you can have a lot of reward from your heavenly father who saw what you did in secret. But the kind of giving I want you to pursue is the don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing kind of giving. Here's a test for you. It's a test for me. Are you willing to write a check but don't tell anybody about it? And something is like, oh, I want people. I mean, not your spouse, obviously. I mean, the two of you together. But you, you want to you give in such a way that you don't need credit for it. Are you willing to do that? Or something and you say, no, I need credit. Well, you can have a little credit now or a lot of credit later. Are you willing to take your wife's favorite list, your husband's favorite list of things they've asked you to do, and you're willing to do it one day uh, on a Saturday, but as soon as they walk in the door, you're not saying, hey, look what I did. And I'm guilty of that. I'm the first to need affirmation and to remind you, hey, do you see how I tried to prioritize you? But would you be willing to secretly serve, secretly sacrifice? When it comes to that, try sacrificing and serving people who are totally unthankful. Oh, I've done it for years. Lived in downtown Chicago. I did work in the inner city and down in Atlanta. It's one thing to say, hey, I went to City Gospel. I felt so good about myself because of the, the, the wonderful things I got to help people. That sometimes happens. But if you're a long-term service to people, usually they're entitled and unthankful. You start going, why am I doing this? And you start wondering, am I really serving because they need it or because I want something out of it? And it begins to really challenge your soul. Am I willing to serve people even when they're entitled or I'm thankful, or I don't get credit. That's my test for you this week. I want you to try giving, serving, and sacrificing where your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing, that you don't need credit for this one. I remember uh, several years ago, we were doing some work as a church with Katrina. So when Katrina came through, they needed water. So we ran a water drive. We're at Cincinnati Country Day at the time. And so I'd been down there several weeks, over the over several days, it was a five-day water drive we were doing. And so John Kirby said, hey, we got a video um, team coming from local news and they're going to do a story on the, on the giving uh, of the water that we're doing. I said, oh, that's awesome. So I had kind of my business casual on, so I drove down there to Cincinnati Country Day School and sure enough, TV cameras are there and they're seeing everybody sweaty. It's a hot, sweaty, you know, July day and they're going up and down the ramp with water and I walked up and what I could have done is just said, hey, I'm just so proud of our church and so proud of the way we're giving. We're having a chance to be part of it, but I'm like, I could be on TV. So I, not in any way dressed like somebody who had actually been doing the work, I suddenly grabbed some water, and I had done it a few days before, so I had been part of the team. But suddenly with the TV cameras, I'm like, <laughs> yep, the camera's on. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and, and you know, they didn't use any of my footage. <laughs> they knew, they knew I wasn't been there all day sweating. I didn't have the right clothes on. I was, they could tell I was there to be seen by men. Not sacrificing and you can sniff out a fake and God says genuine giving is when your left hand doesn't know what your right hand is doing you're serving you're giving other people it's interesting because um, there's a phrase Jesus uses that doesn't show up in any of his biographies it's not in Matthew not in Mark not in Luke not in John in the book of Acts Paul mentions it he says hey let's not forget what Jesus taught us it's better it's more blessed to give than to receive. Do we really believe that's true? It's more blessed to give than receive. Tom and Dickie Smothers used to say it this way. He'd say, it's better to have gifts than receipts. <laughs> yeah, it is better to have gifts than receipts. Is, is what Jesus is saying is true, that's better to give than receive? Because his life demonstrated that. The life and the message of Jesus is that by giving of his life, sacrificing his life, serving us by putting our needs ahead of his own, he was able to offer forgiveness to the entire world. And when that begins to click for you, you start saying, if God did that for me, if he served me, sacrificed for me, and gave for me, I want to try that out. I want to try this left hand, not know what the right hand is doing. I want to choke out the worries of this world. I want to choke out the, the constant need to upgrade and constant need about me. i got no problem spending on me. I want to try spending on others. I have no problem giving to me, but what if I really gave to others? I have no problem serving me, but what if I really served others? How might it reorient my heart? So as a church, that's what we do. We create opportunities for people to serve. You're in a building today because 250 families, 13, 15 years ago, 
gave money to create a facility the hopes that you'd be here. They served, they gave. People today greeted you on the way in because they want you to know that this is a place that we serve other people. We love serving people. It's kids, people right now working with your students, your children, creating a dynamic environment for them to love church so we can be in here studying and laughing together. And maybe you've been on the receiving end of other people's giving and serving and maybe it's time for you to say, you know what, I think I'd like to try that. I want to write a check. Not only for this generation at Horizon, but for the next generation. What God might want to do. Maybe you want to say, hey, I want to serve. Somebody greeted me three years ago and I came in the door. Maybe I could greet someone and make them feel warm and welcome. Or maybe you want to move beyond our four doors and you want to go to our outside structure. And you want to say, this facility is beautiful. How did it get so beautiful? And you realize we have an ecological team. And the ecological team is saying, let's serve our whole community by creating a place, not just for churchgoers, for the whole community, to come and find a, a sanctuary, a place of beauty. We're putting over 1,000 plants in right now. And when I say we're putting 1,000, I mean we've bought 1,000 plants. But we're inviting you and your friends and your family to come with us. If you look at the insert today, it'll have different days, including this Saturday. You can come and be part of creating beauty. We're actually going to put uh, flower beds all around the lakes to bring in the natural butterflies and bees that are part of this area as we work with Cincinnati Nature Center because we believe in serving our environment, serving our church, and serving our community. More than that, we send teams. We just had a team of high school students got back from Mexico. Another team just got back from Happy Church. Here's our Happy Church team. Junior hires, we create environments here at the church that say, let's go serve people. And they go back to one of the most impoverished places in the country in Appalachia is where our team went. And sometimes you go there and they are so grateful. More often than not, you go there and they're pretty entitled and unthankful. But every time you come back and the people go on the team say, wow, I was such an honor to serve. And I get to see people who live in that community who serve selflessly to people who sometimes aren't very thankful. I want to serve like that. I want to give like that. I want to sacrifice like that. What does it look like for all of us to really wrestle with not letting your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And that's my test for you. Try writing a check without getting credit. I tell you, one of the pr- pr- privileges I have as a pastor is I get a chance to walk with families through all stages of life, including funerals. And I had a guy in our church who had been part of uh, putting in the gardens uh, of our church, and he had given financially, significantly be part of that over the years. And at his funeral, I had a, they gave me a list of all the things he had given to. And it wasn't just at our church. In fact, I think if you took the giving of the people who attend our church at all three services and look at how the city of Cincinnati operates from religious to non-religious activities, I think Cincinnati runs on the generosity of this community. So I want to say thank you on behalf of our church for your generosity, but also on behalf of the city. And I'm looking at this list of ways he's given, and I'm like, man... I know he was very secret about his giving. I was talking to his wife. Could I share at his funeral what he's given? She said, no. How'd you get that list? I'm like, I don't know. Somebody thought it'd be good to talk about it. He doesn't want people to know. Why? He wants his reward in heaven. And I mean, I had this page after page of ways he'd given when I did the funeral here. But there was somebody who understood left hand versus right hand giving. In fact, even he won't want me to say this, but I'll do it anyway. Marty was so generous with his time, letting us come down and, and shoot at his place. We tried to give Marty a check, and he refused it. He said, no, God's called me to do some work with St. Jude. Could you just pass on that check to St. Jude? So thank you for your generosity and your demonstration of that. Appreciate it. So here's my challenge to you today as you head out. Pick a fight with something that's trying to, that you need to choke out. Do you need to choke out the fact that you're not a really good listener? Let's pick a fight with that. And let's start being a better listener. Do you need to pick a fight with the fact that you're so about consistency, there's no flexibility? And that it's beginning to choke out your relationships, it's driving people around you crazy? Is it time to choke out the fact that you're always late to everything because you're so flexible, but there's no stability and people can't count on you and you're not very dependable? I want you to pick a fight with one area that needs to be choked out of your life. And maybe that's this lack of of, of two-handed thinking. Maybe it's this this idea that you've let good things like the worries and cares and the upgrade in this world choke out the the, the satisfaction, choke out contentment, and choke out joy. I want you to pick a fight 
with one error you want to choke out this morning. So I invite the band out. I love this song. So I don't know if you've been following Jelly Roll at all. Jelly Roll has become an artist that I've been enjoying listening to because he's just so honest. And this particular song, he just names very specifically the things he wants to fight against. Temptations he has, struggles he has, bad habits he has. And he's kind of saying, God, I, I, I've been trying and I let go and I pull it back up and, I, and I, it choked me out again, so I tried again. God, help me, save me, rescue me from this. I was talking to my Beth buddy Je- Jeff, and I said, hey, you've been training in martial arts for 40 years. He said, what, what's kind of the secret? He said, well, I was at a Gracie uh, school learning jiu-jitsu, and we had this one guy who's a pipe fitter. He said, because he's a pipe fitter, when he put his arms around you, there was this deadlock. Were, he just had strong hands from pipe fitting. He would just hold on to you, and for the three, five-minute fight, you were literally just rolling around. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't get your arms free. He didn't learn anything. You didn't learn anything because he just wouldn't let go. He said, what I learned from that is if you want to learn and if you want to grow and if you want to become everything you want to become, you've got to let go, actually have some failures in your life, actually make some mistakes in your life. You've got to let go if you want to grow. So I want you to think about one area that you want to choke out. And look at Jesus' way of life. He didn't just talk about this. He demonstrated what it was like to be more blessed to give than receive. As you hear the honesty of this song, what it means to be a son of a sinner, think of one area that you've missed the mark or are struggling with that you like God's help with as we close. So I only see in front of me Now the past is out of sight and out of mind So I changed, now I'm back chasing these white lines I'm just a long-haired son of a sinner Searching for new ways I can get gone
You know, I love that honesty. He's like, you know, if I, if I admit what, I, what I'm fighting against, God might hate me, which of course God doesn't. God loves it when we admit what we're fighting against because he does want to save us. He wants to help us. He wants to lead us on a new way. Let me lead you in prayer and I'll send you out with two announcements. Maybe you want to say, Father, I'm getting choked out by some things and I need help. Thank you for demonstrating a life of giving to other people. And thank you for giving your life for me. Teach me how to give and serve and sacrifice with that same spirit. I invite your spirit into my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, three things. If you want to connect with some people around here, I mentioned some of the beauty going on this Saturday. There's a little uh, insert in your program. We'd love you to join our stewardship, ecological stewardship team, as we continue to partner with the Cincinnati Nature Center. Just all kinds of things coming up each month for you and your family and friends. We'd love you to be part of that. Two, we just ended Jesus Jiu Jitsu. So next week, we're starting a series called Foodie. And in Foodie, we have chefs on stage. We're going to be cooking on stage. We're going to make a cooking show for the next four or five weeks. And we're going to make foods in the Bible and learn lessons from the Bible. There's going to be QR codes every week with, with recipes you can take home. Very, very fun. Great series to invite your friends to. Foodie for five weeks. However, if also you're saying, you know what, I got some things in my marriage. I got a good marriage. I like it to be great. Or I've got some hurts in my marriage I'd like to heal from. Starting next week at the first two services, we have a series called Song of Solomon. And if you know what Song of Solomon is, is the PG-13 slash rated R book of the Bible. It's about sex and passion in marriage. We're going to talk about the joys of, of, of pleasure in marriage, the challenges of how we hurt each other because of different appetites, just a really honest look at how to improve that area of our life. So if you're interested, 8.30, 9.45 for the next five weeks, but it is rated PG-13. See you next week.